So moving on now, this is an, here we see an interesting example of a palatal torus, which despite the extensive keratinization that is evident under white light, which would tend to increase the fluorescence since keratin fluoresces, presents as a predominantly dark area through the bellscope. This turns out to be quite typical of palatal tori. The current hypothesis about why this occurs is that there is a relative lack of connective tissue because of the way the mucosa is stretched over the bony protuberance of the torus. A thin layer of connective tissue means that there is not as much highly fluorescent collagen, and this collagen is thought by most experts to be the brightest fluorophore in the oral mucosa. Given the understanding we've gained so far about why the fluorescence visualization through the velscope appears the way it does, the appearance of this case of migratory glossitis under velscope should be of no surprise. The atrophic patch on the dorsal surface is an absence of filiform papilla, and thus an absence of fluorescence from the corresponding keratin. In addition, the reddened inflamed areas contribute to the dark appearance as well. The classic raised white keratin-dense borders predictably look bright when viewed through the velscope. The key concept to grasp here is that there is no additional sign of risk or concern based on the dark appearance through the velscope, because it is manifestly explainable by the presence of the relatively simple features observed under white light. Here is an example of so-called white hairy tongue. The extra long keratinized filiform papilla show up very brightly under fluorescence, as we would expect. This was a patient from a private practice who came to the dentist with a denture plate in her mouth, kept in place with so much denture adhesive that, in the words of the dentist involved, I practically had to use a crowbar to get the plate out of her mouth. The resulting inflammation of the salivary glands on the hard palate show up as little dark patches under velscope, as we would expect from our discussion on inflammation. The other theme and evidence here is to look carefully at the hard palate under white light again, after observing it under velscope the inflammation is also quite apparent there. The abnormal fluorescence pattern is consistent not only with careful observation under white light, but also with the patient history information. Well, this is another example of an ecchymosis showing up dark under velscope because of the localized blood, and which did not blanch. As in the earlier example we saw in the movie, this lesion was gone at the two-week follow-up visit. Here's an example of a permanent dilation of the vascular bed. This is a benign, permanent condition that nevertheless should be monitored for change. This is an amalgam tattoo which shows up as dark in white light just as it shows up as dark under velscope due to light absorption. The presence of filled teeth nearby would help confirm the identification of this particular lesion as an amalgam tattoo. It's worthwhile to take a moment here to discuss pigmented lesions in general. The question sometimes arises with new velscope users. I see a dark area under velscope, or I observed a pigmented lesion under white light. Should I worry? The first answer to this question is that you should expect a dark area under fluorescence from a pigmented lesion under white light. We know from our science discussion in an earlier module that the same tissue optical processes that lead to absorption of light as in a pigmented area, under normal conditions, will also absorb excitation and fluorescence light when observing through the velscope. The secondary question becomes, does the area through the velscope have the same shape as what was seen under white light? If the answer is yes, then all is as it should be, and the lesion should be treated as it would have been treated had the velscope not been used. If the answer is no, then further investigation is probably warranted to understand the reason for this. Needless to say, Patient history and clinical judgment will play a large role in helping you deal with these situations comfortably. This, obviously, is an aphthous ulcer. The inflamed ring around the ulceration, which under white light looks erythematous or red, predictably looks dark through the velscope. Fibromas are an interesting application of some of the fundamental science lessons we learned earlier. They are comprised mainly of poorly vascularized connective tissue. 
the collagen in the connective tissue fluoresces strongly, and because of the lack of vascularity in the connective tissue of a fibroma, there is little blood absorption. Thus, we would expect fibromas to be neutral or slightly brighter in appearance, as is evidenced by the examples on this slide. Squamous papillomas are an interesting illustration of some of the concepts we've learned so far. The structure of the papillona involves highly vascularized fibrous projections which are thrust up toward the surface of the mucosa. The blood absorption in these high vascularized projections leads, quite logically, to a loss of fluorescence. This reddened residual nodule of lymphoid tissue, situated approximately at the area of the palatine tonsil, previously excised in this case, looked very dark under the velscope as one might expect, based on its appearance under white light. could be argued that in this particular case, the appearance of the velscope brings no additional value other than the fact that the areas of darkness exactly correspond to the areas of redness under white light, and no more. In this case, the dramatic appearance under fluorescence does nothing more than to help alert us to its presence, which in this particular case it did. But the presence of darkness corresponding to redness gives us no additional cause for concern above and beyond what the presentation under white light does in and of itself. If there were dark areas extending away from the lesion, not corresponding to the red nodule apparent under white light, this would give us greater cause for concern. The bright yellow appearance under the velscope can be indicative of the proliferation of the fungal organism Candida. Under white light, the appearance is similar to clinical leukoplakia. The fluorescence from both the keratin and from the hyperkeratosis lead to the bright color from the main lesion, but notice the loss of fluorescence around the borders of the hyperkeratotic area, consistent with an inflammatory response. Here is a herpes simplex virus lesion, where the intense inflammation, as evidenced by the erythematous area on the soft palate, looks predictably dark under the velscope. The surface keratinization, symptomatic of smokeless tobacco keratosis, makes the labial mucosa here look brighter than normal, as we might expect. This is lichen planus on the buccal mucosa. Notice how the inflammation evident under white light is better visualized as areas of darkness through the velscope. Although somewhat controversial, chronic lichen planus is sometimes regarded as a possible pre-malignant condition, although only in about 1-2% to of cases. Distinguishing fluorescence loss associated with inflammation from that associated with possible dysplasia could very well be problematic in a typical case of lichen planus. Research continues to be conducted in this area. As it turns out, in this particular case, dysplasia was indeed found in the upper part of the lesion where the arrow indicates in the fluorescence photograph. Notice that this particular area doesn't seem to stand out as much under white light. This is an example of erosive lichen planus, and not surprisingly the inflammation around the central ulceration shows up as dark under velscope. Notice also that the keratinized tissue and the central fibrin clot show up brighter compared to the surrounding inflammation because of the fluorescence associated with both keratin and fibrin. The intense dark areas are entirely consistent with the inflammation, quite evident under white light, that are classically associated with erosive lichen planus. This should not in any sense be viewed as a false positive, merely the fluorescence response to the tissue processes behaving as expected. This is an instructive example to consider, which comprises a leukoplakic type lesion together with a fibrin clot on the lateral border of the tongue. The question is, what do we make of this lesion? Does its appearance through the velscope make us more or less suspicious of potential trouble? Well, we've learned that earlier in this course that fibrin fluoresces relatively strongly under blue light. So the bright fluorescence of the fibrin clot near the center of the lesion is what we expect to see. Areas of fibrin deposition will fluoresce brightly and may mask a loss of fluorescence due to underlying dysplastic processes. In these situations, we look at the areas around the fibrin clot, which are milky white and keratinized under white light. These do not look bright due to keratin, as they would for ordinary hyperkeratosis, but rather 
dark from intrinsic loss of fluorescence from dysplasia. Contrary to an oversimplistic notion that because a central area is bright it's healthy, the presentation of the lesion under fluorescence when taken as a whole helps confirm our suspicion that this lesion needs to be followed up and biopsied. Describing this lesion in some sense as a quote-unquote false negative because of the bright fiber in fluorescence is a rather unenlightened approach to using the Velscope. We certainly don't need a Velscope system to help us find this obvious verrucous carcinoma. This is here to again illustrate the point that an increase in fluorescence does not mean that the tissue here is healthy. The extensive keratin production that is an integral part of a verrucous carcinoma leads to the bright fluorescence. Labeling this a quote-unquote false negative, it's just plain silly. Although not seen in these photographs, the Velscope might have added value to the clinical management of this lesion had it been used to examine the areas around the lesion where there was no keratin. Unexpected dark areas around the borders of lesions when viewed under fluorescence can be of help to specialists during lesion excision.